All right, so this is the last section in chapter three, and we're still on the topic of analyzing arguments. In 3.5, we discussed uh, analyzing arguments using Euler diagrams. And Euler diagrams, although useful, um, especially for giving a visual representation of uh, an argument in a way that kind of mimics Venn diagrams in uh, set theory, they're not really the best method for kind of more complicated arguments. Um, so we're going to look at another technique. We're still analyzing arguments that have the same sort of setup. You know, you have a set of premises and then a conclusion. And uh, what we're going to be doing actually is using truth tables, which we practiced a lot earlier in Chapter 3. Um, so here's, here's the basic idea. Suppose we have some general argument, and we have our premises. I have n premises here, trying to keep things general. Premise 1, premise 2, a bunch in the middle that I'm not writing, and then premise n, followed by some conclusion. Okay, if I wanted to put this in symbolic form, each premise can be assigned a symbol. P1 for premise 1, P2 for premise 2, and Pn for premise n, and so on, you know, for all the other premises in the middle. The conclusion I could call Q. So again, this is symbolic logic. We're trying to assign symbols to statements. Um, <clears throat> remember what it is that we're doing when we're, when we're analyzing an argument. The goal is to uh, basically show that the conclusion follows from your premises. Or, in other words, uh, we want to show that the premises imply the, comp uh, the conclusion. So one way of thinking of that, and again, we're trying to reformulate these arguments in um, a symbolic form that we've already studied in Chapter 3. So my goal here is to take an argument of this form and create a compound statement out of it, which I can then analyze using truth tables. That's what we're going to be doing in this section. So what would that look like? Well, again, if we assume that we have this premise and this premise and this premise and this premise and all the way down to the bottom, notice I'm using the word and. We have a logical connective for the uh, premise and. It's the conjunction. And then we want to show that if we have all of these premises, that they imply the conclusion. Well, when I say the word imply, that makes me think of a conditional. So in other words, if I have premise 1 and premise 2 and premise 3 and so on and so forth, those together should imply the conclusion Q. And so this compound statement is what we can uh, reformulate these arguments into so that we can analyze them using truth tables. Um, now... This, I, I wanted to give you a very general example to give you a sense of the setup for these things. But in all of the arguments that we analyze, um, we're only going to have uh, two uh, premises to analyze. So you're not going to have a whole big list in here. This is just kind of the most general case. I think in the homework, you might encounter one or two problems where there's maybe three premises. But beyond that, you know, we don't really... We're not going to practice, you know, like 12 premises followed by a conclusion. The truth tables would be enormous in those cases, and we're not, we're not looking to do anything like that. Okay, so how do you know if an argument is valid or invalid by uh, using a truth table to analyze this compound statement? Well, if this statement is valid, then it should be true uh, in all possible combinations of the truth values of all of these component statements, the P's and the Q here. Um, anytime, I've mentioned this in the past, but we're going to give this an actual definition now. Anytime you have a compound statement that's true for all possible truth values of its component statements, we call that a tautology. So basically what we're trying to do here is determine whether or not this compound statement, which represents some argument, uh, is a tautology. If it is a tautology, then the argument is valid. If it's not a tautology, which means if there's any case in which this is false, then uh, we would say that the argument is invalid. So let's, let's use an uh, example to illustrate this. Here's the argument we want to analyze. If the weather is nice, then I will go for a walk. That's my first premise. Notice it's given in the form if-then. So my first premise is actually given as a conditional. Next premise, the weather is nice. Conclusion, I will go for a walk. So let's take this argument and put it in symbolic form first. Um, I'm going to say that P is the statement the weather is nice. 
because I'm seeing that statement show up in a couple of places. The weather is nice. Q, I will go for a walk. I will go for a walk. Now we need to um, put this in symbolic form in order to get a truth table out of it. So now that I've uh, uh, determined some statements P and Q, I want to try to rewrite this argument in symbolic form. Let me do that off to the side here. So if the weather is nice, then I will go for a walk. If P, then Q. Symbolically, that's a conditional. P implies Q. Okay. The weather is nice. That's just the statement that I'm calling P. So that would be the second premise. We use this line to separate the premises from our conclusion. What is the conclusion? I will go for a walk. That's statement Q. So we can reformulate this argument symbolically by making our premises P implies Q, and our second premise P, and then our conclusion Q. Okay, And again, what is it that we want to analyze? Well, we want to take our premises and form a conjunction out of those. P implies Q is my first premise. And, whoops, I almost wrote out the word and. We just want that symbol for and. P, if I take these two things together, then uh, have them imply Q that's the component statement or the uh, compound statement that I want to analyze with the truth table. Again, notice what I'm doing. I'm taking my premises, forming a conjunction out of those, and then saying that this conjunction implies my conclusion. Okay, so how do we construct a truth table to analyze this? Well, we take all of our component statements, which are P and Q, those will get their own columns. And then we sort of build up from there. Notice I have a P implies Q in this innermost set of parentheses. So I should make a column for that, P implies Q. Then in addition to that, in the larger square set of parentheses, or sorry, uh, square brackets, I have this conjunction, P implies Q and P. That should also get its own column, P implies Q and P. Finally, uh, this thing here is uh, the antecedent in this larger conditional here. So uh, that entire conditional can now get its own column. P implies Q and P all together implies Q. So this is what our truth table is going to look like. Just like this. There we go. Okay, as usual, we're going to construct all possible combinations of truth values for P and Q, and then the rest of the table should follow from that. So here's our usual four combinations for two component statements. Okay, P implies Q. If you remember, uh, in order for this to be false, the only way that a conditional can be false is if you have an antecedent that is true. That means P would be true and a consequent that is false. Notice that only occurs here. True implies false is false. In all other possible cases, we say that the conditional is true. Okay, next, I have a conjunction. Conjunctions are only ever true when both component statements are true. So this corresponds to my third column, P corresponds to my first column, and I need both to be true. That only happens in the first row, true, true gives me true. In all other combinations, true, false, false, true, false, true, I have at least one false, and so all of those I would say false to. Okay, and now we get to our final uh, compound statement, the, the thing that we wanted to establish. Um, and what I'm doing is I'm taking my uh, conjunction here, which is the previous column, and saying that this column implies Q, which is my second column. So we're kind of going from here to here. Notice the first thing I have is true implies true. In a conditional, that gives me a true. Now notice the remaining three truth values are all falses. And what do we know about conditionals? If the antecedent is false, then it doesn't matter what the truth value of the consequent is. In all of those cases, by the definition of the conditional, we get true. Okay, so notice what happened. This was the uh, compound statement that we wanted to 
uh, analyze. And in so doing, we found that it's true in all possible cases. So this, when you see a T in every entry of this last column here, that's what we call a tautology because it's true regardless of the truth values of P and Q individually. That means that this argument that we started with is valid. Okay. Now one thing I want to point out here is that when you reduce things down to symbolic form, the original statements themselves don't actually matter. No, if I took, notice if I took out uh, the weather is nice and I will go for a walk and put other statements in there, you know, if I have $10, then I will buy a pack of gum or something like that. And then here, if I put, I have $10, and then down here, I put, I will buy a pack of gum. Then symbolically, I would have the exact same form for that argument. P implies Q. P, those are my two premises. Q is my conclusion. In reducing it to symbolic form, the truth table would be identical for that argument because, again, the individual statements P and Q themselves aren't what mattered. It was the form of this argument that mattered. And so what we're going to be looking at as we go through the examples in this section are common argument forms, and they're so common that we give them specific names. Each one is going to have a particular name. Um, and by recognizing these argument forms, we can, we can know immediately if it's going to be a valid or an invalid argument. So notice in this case, we ended up with a valid argument. That means any argument of this form, P implies Q as premise one, P as premise two, Q is my conclusion. This will be valid in, in any time we encounter it. So arguments of that type are given a name. A lot of the, uh, a lot of the um, names for um, different things in symbolic logic or formal logic are given Latin names. So we call this argument form modus ponens. Um, it's also called the law of detachment, uh, depending on, you know, depending on what you prefer. But um, I'm usually going to just refer to this as modus ponens. So learn to recognize that argument form. That's the first major one that most people learn. Okay, let's try a, another example, kind of a similar one. In this case, we're going to say, uh, if the weather is nice, then I will go for a walk. I will go for a walk. Those are my two premises. The weather is nice. That's my consequence, or my, uh, sorry, my um, conclusion. Notice this looks almost identical to the previous argument, but I, what I've done is I've traded my second premise with my conclusion. Previously, the weather is nice was a premise. I will go for a walk was a conclusion. And those have traded places here. I want to see if this argument is still valid or not. Um, on an intuitive level, you may be able to look at this and determine yourself. That doesn't seem like a valid argument. That seems invalid. But let's take the formal approach and, and try using a truth table to establish this. So let's decide what P and Q are, first of all. P and Q are going to be the same as they were previously. Uh, the weather is nice. Q, I, uh, will go for a walk. Okay, now let's try and put this argument in symbolic form. So again, if the weather is nice, then I will go for a walk. If P, then Q. Our first premise looks the same as the previous example. Next premise, I will go for a walk. Well, that's Q now. Conclusion, the weather is nice. That's P. Notice again, the argument has a similar looking form as the previous example. But where I had a P here and a Q here before, they've traded places, Q here and P here. Will this still be a valid argument? Let's determine what it is we're analyzing first. P implies Q is my first premise. And Q, that's my second premise. Put those all together and make that conjunction the antecedent of this conditional. It implies our conclusion P. Okay, so our truth table will also look pretty similar, at least as far as what the columns are. Not identical, but just similar. We need a column for P, a column for Q, a column for P implies Q, that's one of my premises. Then I need to form a conjunction out of that conditional and that uh, Q there. So that's going to look like P implies Q and Q. 
Then finally, I can use the entire compound statement. Uh, P implies Q and Q. All together, this implies P. So let's form columns out of these. Perfect. OK. Again, first two columns are always the same. True, true. True, false. False, true. False, false. All right. Um, P implies Q. Once again, remember, it's easiest to determine the one and only case where this will be false. That's when we have true implies false. But it will be true in all other cases. OK. This time, this conjunction is going to take uh, my previous column, or column three, as one of the component statements, and column two as the other. It's a conjunction involving columns two and three. Remember, this will only ever be true if both of those statements are true. That happens there, and it happens here. It's false in the other cases. All right, now this column. I'm taking as my antecedent in this larger conditional, the previous column, and, so, and my consequent is P, my first column. So true implies true. That's true. False, if my antecedent is false, then it's automatically a true uh, truth value here. So that happens here and here. Let me put a T there and a T there. But notice here, I have true implies false. Okay. Now the fact that I had a false in even just one position in that last column means that this thing is not a tautology. And notice it doesn't actually matter that I have true everywhere else. If I don't have true everywhere in this column, then the argument is invalid. Okay, So we can say that this is invalid. Now, you can think of this intuitively again, and you probably could have surmised that this would have been invalid. If the weather is nice, then I will go for a walk. This doesn't imply that I won't go for walks in other cases. Maybe I like to walk in the rain also. You know, So if it says I will go for a walk, that doesn't necessarily mean that the weather is nice. It just means that I went for a walk, right? So uh, this is not a valid argument. Um, and again, we reduced this argument down to symbolic form here. And there's lots and lots and lots of arguments that could have taken an identical form as, the, uh, uh, as this if I just change what P and Q are. Um, so this actually gives us an, a, an analysis for a whole slew of arguments that take this form. This particular form, P implies Q and Q as my two premises um, with the conclusion P is, uh, again, has a name. We call it the fallacy of the converse. Okay, and the idea here, remember we talked about the converse uh, as one of those uh, statements that are related to the conditional back in 3.4. The converse, if you have a conditional that says P implies Q, the converse of this would be Q implies P. And notice P is what we're taking as the consequent of these premises. So Q implies P is where we're getting the term converse from. And basically what you can deduce from this is that if a conditional P implies Q is true, that doesn't necessarily mean that its converse is true, Q implies P. We showed this back in 3.4 where we, where we said that the, uh, a conditional statement is not equivalent to its converse. So it's kind of the same underlying concept at play there. Uh, so again, fallacy of the converse. We call it a fallacy because it's an invalid argument. Um, related to that, if you remember when we talked about, again, in 3.4, those related terms, the conditional P implies Q is not equivalent to its inverse, not P implies not Q. And so we're not going to do an example for this one, but for similar reasons, any argument that takes this form, P implies Q as premise one, not P as premise two, conclusion not Q, this is also an invalid argument form. If we looked at an argument that had this form and constructed a truth table for it, similar to what we had up here, we would not have true for every single truth value. You can try this on your own to verify that, but we would end up with a, a false somewhere, meaning it's not a tautology and the argument is invalid. So we call that one the fallacy of the inverse. Again, these are both fallacies. They are invalid arguments. Let's try another one. I'm gonna analyze this next argument now. 
Um, if I study all night, then I will pass my test. Premise one. Premise two. I did not pass my test. Conclusion. I did not. I did not study all night. So once again, I can see two component statements that we want. P and Q, and up here I have another if-then statement, another conditional. So the conditional, as in the previous two examples, has both P and Q in it, if I study all night. So P should be I study all night. Q, I will pass my test. I, I'll just say I pass my test, same thing. Okay, what does this argument look like symbolically then? Well, again, if I study all night, then I will pass my test. If P, then Q. So symbolically, I have a conditional again. This time, it says I did not pass my test. Q is I passed my test. So to say I did not, that's the negation of this statement. So my second condition is, or my second premise is not Q. Okay, remember, that's it's important to people to recognize negations here. What's the uh, conclusion? I did not study all night. Well, that also looks like a negation, this time uh, the negation of P, okay, or not P. So that is the argument that we're analyzing here. How do we form a compound statement out of this to uh, analyze using a truth table? Well, again, you take your two premises. P implies Q is our first premise. Form a conjunction with those not Q is my second premise, and then we take that entire conjunction and create a conditional out of that where the conclusion not P is the uh, consequent. Okay, so again, only two component statements, P and Q here, our um, truth table will have a similar look to it here as well. P implies Q. Notice my second uh, conditional here is not Q. I'm going to put that here. Normally I would put uh, negations first, but in this case it's not going to actually matter which of these two come first. Um, and then uh, I need to form a conjunction out of both of those. So I'm going to have P implies Q and not Q. And then I can have my entire uh, compound statement. Not Q and not Q implies not P. Okay, so now let's form our columns. Okay. Two component statements, meaning I have four rows as usual. P implies Q, again, only ever false if true implies false, which is here, true elsewhere not Q, I'm comparing to the second column. It should have the opposite truth value that I see here, so that should be false, true, false, true. Now, this column is a conjunction formed from the previous two columns. If a false appears anywhere in either of those two columns, this will be false. So I'm seeing falses for my first three entries, but a true, true here, which gives me a true conjunction. Okay, now, um, comes the, the main um, part of the argument that we're looking at, or the, the, uh, uh, compound, the compound statement that represents our argument. So this antecedent is the previous column, and I'm checking to see if that implies not P. I just realized I didn't create a column for not P. I wonder if I can squeeze that in somewhere. Hmm. So I jumped the gun a little bit. I missed a column. Let me see if I can squeeze that in right here. Not P. Again, normally my negations would have shown up earlier. In this particular case, you're, it's going to not actually matter. We're able to put the negation here. So I need not P. P is true, true, false, false. So the negation will be false, false, true, true. <clears throat> okay. Again, it's a conditional, and this time it's uh, this column implies this column. Remember, if the antecedent is false, then the conditional is true giving me true for the first three cases. My last row gives me true implies true, which is also true. Notice we have a tautology, trues in that entire column. That means this is a valid argument. Okay, now again, this was the argument form. P implies Q for our first premise, not Q for the second premise. 
not P is our consequence or our um, conclusion. So arguments that have that form to it also have a Latin name. They're called modus tollens. Compare that to modus ponens, which was the first example that we looked at. Modus tollens here, or it's also sometimes called the law of contraposition. And again, the reasoning behind this name is because what we're really looking at is a contrapositive. We looked at the contrapositive as a related statement to the conditional back in 3.4. And if you think about this, P implies Q, that's the conditional. And then here we can think of this as uh, if not Q, then not P. That's the contrapositive of this statement. And we showed back in 3.4 that the conditional is equivalent to its contrapositive, meaning that they have, they always have matching truth values. So that's one way of analyzing this and looking at the fact that this would be a valid argument in all possible cases. Okay, we have more to do, but I'll um, do that in the next video.